All right, I hope you guys enjoyed lectures five and six with Dr. Johnson in CLIA boot camp. Um, today we are on lecture seven, clinical laboratory organization. So here we go. Our objectives, um, number one, describe the role of the clinical laboratory in patient care. Number two, discuss the major responsibilities and qualifications of the laboratory director, technical consultant, clinical consultant, general supervisor, and testing personnel. Number three, recognize the typical relationship of the above employees in a laboratory organizational chart. And number four, distinguish between various sites of laboratory testing, including the central laboratory, point of care testing, physician office laboratory, and a reference laboratory. So we'll start with the role of the clinical laboratory. The laboratory, as you guys know, plays a critical role in healthcare. Our job is to provide reliable laboratory data to healthcare providers involved in patient care. And that includes doctors, APRNs, PAs, nurses, anyone um, that needs that information. There are over 300,000 laboratory professionals in the U.S. and more than 7 billion clinical lab tests are performed annually. Laboratory testing is the single highest volume medical activity. Um, it represents just 2% of healthcare spending but influences around 70% of medical decisions. So based on that, we're kind of a big deal. This is um, an example of a hospital organizational chart. And if you look over here, the purple arrow, I have um, that pointing towards where the clinical laboratory falls with pathology. Um, the lab is generally considered an ancillary or clinical services um, department. And usually we're grouped with the same, in the same category as radiology techs, respiratory therapy, physical therapy, just any of those that are also considered ancillary services. Okay, we're gonna talk about the responsibilities and qualifications of laboratory personnel as it's outlined in CLIA. So I know you guys just went through CLIA boot camp, so hopefully this will be a quick review for you guys and, and you remember all this stuff. So remember that CLIA 88 implemented required qualifications for laboratory personnel depending on what level of testing is being performed. And the three levels of testing are waived, moderate complexity, and high complexity. Um, so there's also this sort of side category that doesn't get talked about very much, um, and it's called Provider Performed Microscopy, or PPM. So the organizations that accredit labs, which we went over in lecture four, they, they must be at least as stringent as CLIA, if not more so. And that includes ensuring that all of these um, personnel that are doing testing are qualified to do so. So now we're gonna talk about the different testing levels, the criteria for each, the requirements for personnel, and sort of tests um, that are examples of each each level of testing. And we're gonna start with the CLIA waived test. So in order to be considered CLIA waived, tests must be non-critical. They are approved by the FDA for home use. They use simple and accurate methodologies, and they must not pose a risk of harm to the patient if they are performed incorrectly or if erroneous results are reported. So they try to make wave testing um, almost foolproof, like the easiest kind of testing. Requirements for CLIA wave testing personnel include having a lab director that is a qualified lab director. Um, this person would be a licensed MD, DO, which is a doctor of osteopathy, or DPM, which is doctor of podiatric medicine. That's right, a podiatrist, foot doctor. Why they got involved in this, I'm not really sure. 
Um, but that person, the lab director, is responsible for the overall operation and administration of the lab performing wave testing. There are no specific re requirements outlined in CLIA for personnel performing wave testing. Let me say that one more time. There are no specific requirements outlined in CLIA for personnel performing wave testing. So just about anybody can do wave testing. They are, however, required to meet any facility defined requirements and are responsible for specimen processing, testing and reporting results. Um, the CDC has several resources for wave testing, including a booklet called Ready, Set, Test. Um, this booklet is very helpful for anyone that's performing wave testing that maybe doesn't have the education um, or the background in lab sciences that might need to know what the rules are. And then the image here is actually a printable poster that can be printed out and posted anywhere wave testing is performed. Um, and it basically walks you through the steps to make sure that you're doing everything correctly. So what are some examples of wave tests? Some wave tests um, include urine dipsticks, uh, non-automated fecal occult blood, so like the little cards, if you guys have ever done the little fecal occult blood cards, urine pregnancy tests that use visual color comparison, hemoglobin, the copper sulfate that's non-automated, uh, blood glucose using a glucose monitor that has been cleared by the FDA for home use and there are some rapid flu, rapid strep, rapid RSV um, kits that are actually CLIA waived and you'll see there's a couple pictures of, their, of those there. And sometimes these are actually done in the lab. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are done point of care testing or outside of the lab. We, we actually use these sometimes in the lab as well. So let's talk real quick about provider performed microscopy. You may run into this at some point in your career. Um, this is such a weird little side category. Anyone performing provider performed microscopy must have a lab director that is qualified to manage and direct personnel and the performance of PPM procedures. So the testing personnel is going to be a physician, a mid-level practitioner, or a dentist. Mid-level practitioner would be an APRN or a PA, um, something in there. And the lab director is responsible um, for overseeing anyone that performs these procedures. And then anyone that is performing the procedures, they're responsible for processing the specimen, testing, and reporting results. So the CDC also has resources about provider performed microscopy. And these are sometimes performed in physician offices or urgent care settings, um, places like that. So examples of PPM procedures. This is a, a little list of um, things that they are allowed to do. So wet mount, um, a KOH prep, which that can be done on a vaginal swab, uh, usually to look for yeast. Um, it can be done on hair, skin, or nails to look for fungus. Um, it's kind of a quick test to look for that kind of stuff. Pinworm examination is looking, obviously, for pinworms. The fern test, this is a test that is not um, commonly performed anymore. In fact, I've never seen this test done, but they are allowed to do this. And it's a test that looks for amniotic fluid leakage. They can do examination of vaginal or cervical swabs. Um, I've seen this done, they're looking for trichomonas or something like that that doesn't have a very long life outside of the body, so they need to find it quickly. If they're in an urgent care setting or a physician's office setting, um, it may not make it to the lab in order to be identified and diagnosed. So sometimes they'll do that in-house. In they can do urine sediment examination. Um, nasal smear for granulocytes, where they specifically would be looking for eosinophils, looking for um, indication of allergic rhinitis. And then they can also look for fecal white blood cells. 
um, which can be an indicator of bacterial infection or um, shigellosis or salmonellosis or something along those lines. Fecal white blood cell examination, I've never seen them do um, because it requires stains. And if they want that, they can just send that to the lab and have it stained along with the culture because they're going to want to culture it too for the most part. But this can be done some places and, and might actually be done some places. Moving on to moderate complexity testing criteria. Tests that are moderate complexity require minimal scientific and technical knowledge or training to perform accurately. So the operational steps are automatically executed and are easily controlled um, with minimal result interpretation and clinical judgment required. So the image here is an Abbott Piccolo Express. It's a small chemistry analyzer. And I chose this analyzer for a reason. Um, this analyzer is capable of running little chemistry panels or it can do individual analytes. So the panels are run using a disc like the one that's pictured here next to it. And if you're running the panel using the discs, this is considered a uh, waved testing. However, if you are running individual analytes on this instrument, it's considered moderate complexity. So my point here is just that some instruments, um, if you're using a certain test methodology, it may be considered waived. If you're using a different test methodology, even though you're using the same instrument, it may be considered moderate complexity. So you have to be careful with that and make sure that you are um, reading your package inserts and, and researching to know what tests that you're using, make sure that they are appropriate. Although, when we look at the personnel requirements for moderate complexity testing, um, the requirements for the lab director um, state that they are responsible for all operational aspects of the lab. So, in reality, the lab director is going to be in charge of making sure that those laboratory tests are being performed correctly. So personnel requirements for moderately complex testing um, are more stringent than those for wave testing for good reason. Um, and there are requirements for a laboratory director, a technical consultant, a clinical consultant, and testing personnel. Now often these are the CLIA titles, um, but often in the laboratory they will have different titles, but they're fulfilling these roles and requirements for CLIA. They're just called something else. So the laboratory director must have a minimum of a bachelor's degree with two years of experience and two years of supervisory experience um, in order to be the lab director of a moderately complex um, laboratory. So like I stated, the position is responsible for all operational aspects of the lab, but they also must be accessible for consultation as needed. The technical consultant must have a minimum of a bachelor's degree with two years of laboratory experience. And this person is responsible for technical and scientific oversight of the lab. So the clinical consultant must be a licensed MD, DO, or DPM and must be qualified as a lab director. They are responsible for providing consultations about test selection and interpretation of results to any clients. And they are also um, responsible for making sure that results reports contain all the pertinent information. So what's some pertinent information you would want to make sure is on your results reports? Well, definitely your patient result but also you would wanna make sure that the correct um, normal ranges are listed, that your test methodology is listed, um, where the test was performed. Those are kind of all requirements to have on there as well. Testing personnel for moderate complexity testing must have a minimum of a high school diploma uh, with an appropriate amount of training. So, that doesn't mean that they have to have, so they don't have to have any type of um, laboratory education. They can be trained on the job to do moderate complexity testing. 
Um, these people, anyone doing the testing, are responsible for specimen processing, testing, and reporting of results. Now, take note of the note over here. The laboratory director can also serve as the technical and clinical consultant, as well as testing personnel, if they are qualified to do so. So if you have a laboratory director that is a licensed MD, DO, or DPM, they can fill all of these roles. So what does it take to be considered a high complexity test? Well, highly complex tests require specialized scientific and technical knowledge, training, and experience to perform accurately. The operational steps require very close monitoring or control, and extensive independent interpretation and clinical judgment are required. Um, so I put this picture over here. This is actually some crazy picture of like a coag cascade. Um, this is something that would take extensive independent interpretation um, and specialized scientific and technical knowledge to understand. And you guys, at some point, if you don't already, will be familiar with the coag cascade. So um, personnel requirements for high complexity testing labs. So these are the most stringent um, requirements and we want that to be the case because these high complexity tests require, again, the specialized scientific knowledge. Um, so requirements for this include those for a lab director, a technical supervisor, a clinical consultant, a general supervisor, and testing personnel. So the laboratory director must be qualified to manage and direct personnel and the performance of high complexity tests. This person must be a licensed MD, DO, DPM, or hold a doctoral degree. They are responsible, again, for all operational aspects of the lab and must be accessible for consultation. Generally, in the hospital, your lab director is going to be a pathologist. Um, and pathologists are fabulous, as you can see in the image here to the right. So the technical supervisor must have a minimum of a bachelor's degree plus four years of training or experience. Um, they are responsible for the technical and scientific oversight of the lab, and they must be available to provide technical supervision um, or consultation as needed. So the clinical consultant must be a licensed MD, DO, or DPM and um, qualified as a lab director. And just because they're qualified to be a lab director does not mean that they are the lab director. They just must meet those qualifications. They are responsible for consulting with clients about appropriateness of testing and result interpretation, as well as, again, ensuring that the results reports contain any relevant information that's needed to interpret the test results. Now, the general supervisor is a new um, title here. So we didn't have this in the moderate complexity or the waived, um, but it is required for high complexity testing. So the general supervisor must be qualified to provide supervision day to day. They have a minimum of a bachelor's degree with one year of training and experience. Um, in addition to daily supervision, this person is also required to be accessible to provide consultation and resolve problems. Um, so generally, they're providing consultation to their staff. Then finally, we have testing personnel. Um, they must have a minimum of an associate's degree, and they are responsible for all aspects of lab testing and results reporting. They are required to follow all policies and procedures. So note, again, the note, um, the laboratory director in this case may be all of these things if they are qualified to do so. Um, actual image to the left of a lab director trying to be all the things all the time. That would be nuts.
So in addition to all of these um, staff members, generally you will have laboratory support staff, especially in a hospital setting. There are not as many um, regulations surrounding this and most of the requirements are put in place by the facility. Sometimes you will have laboratory assistants. Um, they usually will have a high school diploma. They get on-site training. There are certification programs available for them if they wish to do that or if their facility requires that. And then they are responsible for specimen processing and sometimes phlebotomy. And sometimes your hospital or institution will have phlebotomists. Phlebotomists, usually there's vocational training available for them or some places will do on-site training or a certification program and phlebotomists are responsible for collecting patient specimens. Usually you think of phlebotomists as drawing blood, but they usually will also collect if there's um, like a urine specimen that needs to be collected or, or something that's not invasive. So this is an example of a laboratory organization chart. Um, and remember that titles are often different in the lab than they are in the CLIA regulation. So your medical director usually in a hospital setting is going to be your pathologist. Your administrative director or maybe general supervisor um, sometimes holds a master's degree, not all the time. And then you will have your section managers or like your section supervisor um, will have a minimum of a bachelor's degree. And then your bench techs, your MLSs and MLTs, um, will have a bachelor's or associate's degree. And then you'll have your lab support staff. So if you have lab assistants or um, lab processors or anything like that, they will get on the job training or maybe have a certification program or a vocational program that they've been through. So when we think of laboratory testing, we tend to think of the hospital lab, but laboratory testing can be performed in other places also, um, especially when we're talking about waived testing. So different sites of lab testing sometimes are referred to as centralized lab testing and decentralized lab testing. So we're going to talk about those um, a little bit as well. Centralized lab testing refers to testing done in the hospital lab and it includes all the usual lab departments. So you've got chemistry, hematology, immunology, micro, blood bank. Sometimes these labs will be set up where they have a core lab which consists of maybe hematology, chemistry, urinalysis, coags, immunology. Those are all sort of in one space and then there's a separate micro and blood bank area. Um, I guess they think micro smells bad, so they put them away from everybody else. And they think blood bank needs like super concentration, and so they put them off by themselves also. So decentralized testing consists of point of care testing, um, physician office lab testing, and reference labs. Point of care testing, or you sometimes you'll see POC or POCT, um, it sometimes is referred to as bedside testing. So this kind of testing is usually uh, waived, CLIA waived, and it can, since it's done near the patient, it can reduce turnaround times and give more immediate results, but it's often more expensive than just um, sending to the lab. And then any instruments that are used for point of care testing must have built-in QC. So there's no way for people to not QC that instrument because we know that would happen if that wasn't built in. Physician office labs, generally they're going to offer just a limited test menu. Um, they might do wave testing or moderate complexity testing. Um, and their test menu is usually based on tests they would do frequently or something that might increase convenience for patients. And reference labs, um, they generally perform more complex testing, um, testing that may not be frequently ordered or is considered too expensive to run in-house will sometimes be sent out to a reference lab. And sending to reference labs does require couriers or commercial delivery systems um, or maybe shipped 
via FedEx. Um, and it requires special specimen handling. So if you're sending out specimens in your lab, you need to make sure that you are Department of Transportation or DOT um, trained to do that. And then your couriers are actually also required to do some training as well um, in order to transport specimens. Okay, that brings us to the end of this lecture. As always, if you have questions, comments, or concerns, please contact me. I'm happy to help. I'm available for you guys. Um, I have posted a few things for you guys to look through. Um, there's a CAP guideline to accreditation. It's got some good information in it. There's also a CAP chart um, of personnel requirements, and it does a great job of really kind of condensing those requirements down into a nice, pretty chart. So pull that up, take a look at it. Um, I might post some other things for you guys just to look at. I do not expect you to read these things word for word. They are more just um, references for you guys. So take a look at those. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And I will see you for the next lecture.